Travel this state enough and you'll notice things are changing. Landmarks are disappearing. Details in the smaller corners are fading. Travel this state some more and you'll notice some things never change. A spirit of lost Louisiana does remain. The good book cautions us with this, remove not the landmarks thy fathers have set. But time, compounded with ambivalence, is stealing landmarks across Louisiana. Travel in any direction and you'll notice familiar stores and even some churches with peeling paint. Things are changing for many of us too fast. That's why we thought we'd take to the road again to visit the landmarks our fathers have set before it's too late. This is a search for some vanishing reminders of who we are and a reminder that there are in our time and in our midst people and places and institutions we should preserve or at least treasure before they are gone. Along Irish Bend Road outside Franklin, this is a landmark even the locals have come to take for granted. Medrick Martin's store is as familiar as the growing seasons for sugarcane, and all around it, cane fields still bear the staple crop of this country life. But the sugar mill that supported hundreds of families closed down a few years ago. Medrick Martin is still here because Medrick Martin is an extraordinary man. We don't have many little country stores left out here. Because when I first started in 1935, we had five stores around the Irish Bend. And I, I think I was the last one that started. And I'm the last one left. I'm still here. And thinking the way the situation is going now, I really don't know how long I can last. He started wearing that bright red hat when he took over this store. Over the years, he's had others, and they've always been red. When he went to buy a new one, maybe in 1945, all they had was red. You'd be right to think Medrick Martin is set in his ways. You see, he's from an age when consistency was good. Well, it's terrible out there. The first hog, you kill a hog, you, your neighbors and all had a piece of it and thing. But not there's the people don't live like we used to live. We, we used to live together. And now, because uh, most of the time, these people work for 40 cents a day. I mean, from daylight till dark. They didn't have no such a thing as eight hours a day. Myself, when the eight hours a day came in, I, I, was, I was working at, at the mill. See, I worked part time working the fields to help my daddy. My daddy was a farmer. Medrick Martin not only sold general merchandise, but beer and drinks to white and black alike. Field hands and cane mill workers would come here after their turn in the rows. They would come here in the late afternoons and raise the roof. The Cajuns call a store like this where people come to drink and pass a good time. They call that a bujum. That's what they used to call my place, the bujum. That originally come that they used to call this the bujum. The bujum, what, is, what does a bujum mean? That means dive in, fall in. Bujum means fall. <laughs> so you're going to fall over. You can only imagine now the parties because the mill is closed and only a few revelers still come by the bujum. It's just not the same as when Medrick Martin opened this side room in 1936. Medrick and Mildred have been married for almost 60 years, and he still calls her the sweetest thing that ever came out of Generette. Well, we have our ups and downs. Like anybody that's married will have a little contrary, but you see, when she gets mad, I stay glad. <laughs> Medrick Martin is an extraordinary man. Every day he has gotten up with the sun and gone to bed not long after it set on the cane fields of St. Mary Parish. Every day, every day, he has opened this store because the people depended on him to do it. He put his children through college on the profits of this store on these Tupelo floorboards, now smooth with the wear of his feet and the feet of children buying candy and mothers buying diapers he still walks. He has walked on these boards for 60 years. This is one of the original that I got when I came in the store. 
Now, it's starting to show its age too, because it's starting to, it's, it's wear too. I can show you sort of that. You, you see the hole is starting to come out there. Okay. I had to make a little repairs on it if you ask What is that? It's that's very a, smooth. That, that's a hole. Well, that's where I rub my hand till it's wore completely out, so I had to do a little patchwork on it. And so you've patched it under here? Patched it under there. Let's you see. wore out the wood? Wore out the wood with my fingers coming through. You uh, wore out the wood right. in this after 60 years? After 60 years. That's one of the original ones I had. And I never owned the cash register in my life. Does this tell you something about how long you have been here, Mr. Martin? I've been here a, little, a pretty good little a while. A pretty good little while. Yes. <laughs> the sanding of human tirelessness. And at the corner of one counter, a worn spot where he has rested his feet these 60 years. My hand here, here for a little support, and put this foot here, and I, that foot there. <laughs> In those 60 years, Mildred Martin has traveled the world on cruises and trips to Europe and even to the Great Wall of China. And he, he never would go, you see. While Medrick Martin stayed at the store on Irish Ben Road. He'd leave about four o'clock in the morning sometimes. He'd come back. He wouldn't come for lunch. He'd come back maybe at seven, seven o'clock some night, sometimes later. That's when he'd eat his main meal. Someone had to open and close and tend to the needs of the people of the cane fields and the families that have by now all moved away. Where 500 families had credit recorded in his book, there are now 10. There is hardly anyone left to come to the Bujum. What's your philosophy on, on why there aren't any more country stores like this? Well, it's getting harder. The big companies came in and they, they don't want to deliver to little country stores. And when the big stores, guess, I guess they buy in volume, they get it so much cheaper, then they can sell it cheaper than a little country store can. There's a Walmart in Franklin, isn't there? I guess so. They have a Walmart in Franklin. And uh, they, they like to go at, in a store where they can get everything in the world they want. And a little country store can't afford to stock everything because he'd have too much left on hand. But watch this. A customer walks in wanting some transmission oil. Does Medrick Martin have it? Okay. So uh, well, we just have what the uh, necessities of life. The way well, I, just saw, I just saw a guy walk in and get transmission oil. Well, we have that. That's a necessity. He have to ride in his automobile a little bit. These country boys have a little automobile, so they got to have a little bit of transmission oil. <laughs> You've got to have some of the things, regular stuff. But oh, nothing up. fancy. Nothing fancy, no, sir. You don't want no, no, no dead stuff. I guess the changes over the years have been gradual. There's the closing down of the sugar mill about, about four years ago, but that was dramatic. But things, you don't notice them changing, do you? No, you sure don't. It, it, it looks like it, it grows on you. It looks like the modern time just grew on us. It thing it come and thing. Do you ever feel like you're out of touch? Uh -huh. like, you ever feel like you're out of touch? Like 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 you've been left behind? Well, That's a sad thing to so, say. I, some, but sometimes you do when you sit on about four or five hours without getting the customer. You know, it, 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 it makes you stop and wonder what happened. Yet Medrick Martin is an extraordinary man who will not surrender to the economy or even the passage of time. He may yet wear through these slow times as he has worn out the wood in his store. For some people, satisfaction lies in money or power or fame. Medrick Martin has been satisfied to do one thing well. He is constant. There is no medal for Medrick Martin from the Chamber of Commerce. There will be few people who come back to the cane fields of St. Mary Parish to tell him what should be said. We will say it for all of them. Medrick Martin is an extraordinary man. There are all over this state people who embody a Louisiana spirit of constancy. But even the extraordinary individuals among us can be overlooked. 
Take, for example, a folk singer and songwriter of legendary talent. Hudy Ledbetter has been gone for almost 50 years. Yet only now the towns of North Louisiana, where he once played and sang, are coming to terms with how best to remember him. In the center of Shreveport, you'll find a statue. A man in a suit, pounding a guitar and belting out a song. His manner is exuberant, his face happy. Lead Belly is again standing on the corner, playing a familiar tune. One of his many tunes that all of America still sings. Well, the bull weave a lamb, a little black bull, come from Mexico, they say, uh-huh, come all the way to Texas, looking for a place to stay, he's looking for a home, looking for a home. They are songs from the country, north of Shreveport, east of Texas. Songs from the shaded dirt lanes and brilliant cotton fields. Hewley Ledbetter was born more than a century ago near Mooringsport. His parents' farm was a corner of what's still called the Jeter Plantation, and he applied a natural gift of tireless effort to learning music, as well as to having a good time at house parties come the week's end. Hey, 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 hey. There are a few photos of those parties, but musicians who played them, like 84-year-old Jesse Thomas, can paint a word picture. It wasn't just uh, one style. It was blues, stanza song, popular song, or hillbilly, or whatever you call it. And you could, could mix it up, you know. But you wouldn't have to play over four or five songs. <laughs> you play one song so long and then play another one. And you go back and play the same song over again. And people didn't mind? No. And a lot of times musicians would go play a party or a dance and get drunk and couldn't play no more. Some of them would fall out drunk and still get paid. But you <laughs> you go to a play engagement now and go there and get drunk. Man, they wouldn't, they'd put you in jail if you pull a stunt like that. Beauty Ledbetter played the dances, even parties for white people and businesses trying to gather a crowd of customers. He picked cotton, hundreds of pounds of it each day. And as hard as he worked, he played in the segregated corner of Shreveport called St. Paul's Bottoms. Today, children make the rowdiest noises here, but Parish Councilman Donald H. recounts the colorful past of Fannin Street. This is a do drop in on Fannin Street. This is where Lead Belly, as I understand, spent a lot of time playing. If you notice upstairs, uh, there are a lot of windows there, and there are small rooms. Oh, uh, these were the rooms that were rented by the hour. This was the legal red light district. This was the red light district in Doris. As condoned by the city, the fathers. city fathers. By That's the city it. fathers, right. What, did that, what does that say about the town? That it was a, almost a frontier town? That it was it a, certainly a rough and tumble kind of place? Well, I think, I think history books will tell us that Shreveport was a kind of rough and tumble town. Beauty Ledbetter played and sang in night spots all around the Northwest and Texas in those bustling days of horse carts and steamships and cotton bales and bootleg whiskey. The walls of some dance halls, one witness wrote, were peppered with bullet holes. From the windows howled jazzy music. Beauty Ledbetter distilled, rewrote, outright composed, or made up on the spot, hundreds of songs. 
Ledbetter cousin, Tom Moore. Maybe he, on the job, he would sit down and uh, look at the cotton field. That's, that's what he did. Like he was picking cotton, and then they had something called a bow weaver. And he got a song about that. And the bow weaver would get in the bowl of the, co of the cotton, and he would, he would destroy that bowl. And then that cotton couldn't produce right. And then he would, he would look at that thing, look at that fly flying, and look at that bow weaver, and then he'd make up a song. He would compose a song about that thing. He was one of the great musicians of that wonderful hybrid period in which jazz and blues and folk were all reared. A hard-drinking, hard-playing, consummate folk around. balladeer. This Let is say. Hewdy Ledbetter. The law caught up with Ledbetter many times. He escaped a chain gang, yet he was kind-hearted and took three orphan girls into his home. They say he shot a man, then he broke out of jail for three days. He served more than six years in prison before being pardoned by the governor of Texas. Legend has it the governor was moved by his singing. At least that's the legend. And always this legend was playing and singing. In 1930, even that got him into trouble. He didn't get in trouble. They put him in trouble. The Salvation Army Band was playing in Morrisburg. He came to town like lunch hour. And he loved it to dance. He loved the music. And they was playing the music. And he was tap dancing down the street with the music. And these uh, evil men uh, went out and told him what I told you. Nigga, what you doing dancing out here to this music? And they kicked him and hit him. And he pulled a knife out and he cut one. He served one of three prison sentences at Angola. Here and in Texas, he heard and wrote even more folk songs of hard work, desperation, and prisoner dreams. Then he met John Lomax, the famous collector of folk songs. Lomax and his son, Alan, recorded dozens of songs by Lead Belly, as he was known by then, on a primitive machine. Lead Belly was a treasure chest of stories and songs. He went on to perform concerts on both coast and Europe. By the time of his death in 1949, his musical contribution had helped launch the folk movement in America. Lead Belly preserved the vanishing music of the common man. But what an uncommon man he was. Lost Louisiana will continue. There is still a tremendous spirit of invention and perseverance in our people, but for a visitor to Louisiana, without the time to get to know us, there are fewer and fewer physical reminders of this rich culture. The train stations and turn of the century feed stores are evaporating. Sometimes, when they are deliberately torn down, we might even take it as a symptom of sweeping cultural change. They tore down the Grand Theater in Thibodeau. They tore it down. I feel like uh, something missing. It's gonna be missing. It's sad. Why? The whole family worked here. And it's just like another death.
Shirley Barrios and the older people in this South Louisiana town are saying farewell to an old friend. They stand in the street and watch in silent sadness as this landmark of their childhood is rendered plank by cypress plank as the old bricks are pulled from old mortar. It's just an old eyesore now, but it's still something missing. A lot of eyesores in a lot of small towns are coming down. It's Thibodeau's turn now to lose so much more than a landmark. It was like a civic center. In those days, in the 30s, uh, a lot of the high schools would have their uh, graduation exercise here on the stage with their families and friends sitting in the audience enjoying the uh, performances. We'd have kiddie movies on a Saturday morning to get the kids out of mom and daddy's heads for, for a little while anyway. So uh, we'd have a series of uh, cartoons. We'd have these uh, Laurel and Hardy uh, shorts, all gang comedies, uh, the Three Stooges. And there was no charge, it was just a, it, it was more like a, a public service. Elmo Barrios was the projectionist at the Grand Theater. Want to guess how long he worked there? 34 years. Now the Grand is literally coming down around him. When the theaters open, when it's always, you take it for granted because it's there. That's the Grand Theater. You're going to show. <laughs> Start breaking it down. It bring, you bring it back to the memories that, have, that you've gone through. And uh, they were good memories, all good memories. When the doors of the Grand opened in 1922, the people of Thibodeau entered through them a whole new era. A little fishing town would see the world. Through newsreels, the Bayou kids went on expeditions to Antarctica. They crossed the desert with Lawrence of Arabia. They crossed the ocean in the spirit of St. Louis. They danced with Fred and Ginger. The movies had come to town, and the town would never be the same. Think of the wondrous things that just for a nickel swept us all away. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. What about us? We'll always have Paris. Charlie Chaplin's The Idol Class played that first week. How fitting, as the hardworking people of Thibodeau could now escape the working world for a few hours to meet the stars who visited them at the Grand. Gee, that sounds swell to me. The faces in close-ups, 20 feet high, what effect the stories and stars had on all the people in all the small towns with theaters just like the Grand. I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Clark Gable, Myrna Loy, uh, Norma Sherrill. Oh, she was always my favorite. She was in the early, she was mostly in the silent, but she was a beautiful woman. And there was uh, Spencer Tracy, he was a great favorite. All those years of all those stars and small Thibodeau got sophisticated after seeing the world at the Grand. They stopped coming to this old-fashioned place. They wanted the 50-foot screen in the shopping mall. They forgot their old friend, the tired-looking Grand. The concession stand was over to the left here. Uh, the bathroom facilities were to, to the right. This was a flight of steps coming up to this floor. Larry Abair is in charge of tearing down the Grand. It is with no joy that he does it. He was one of those kids who sat in the dark with wide eyes. Always sat towards the back or either upstairs. Uh, but there was quite a few uh, live entertainers that uh, entertained us in our young days. Uh, really? After the show? Or... No, uh, just live entertainment and, you know, uh, it was like what? special shows. Like what? Such as, uh, I could remember Lash LaRue, who was uh, uh, with a whip, 
with a bull whip. And he Lash LaRue. Lash LaRue. So he had a whip, and what would he do? He would have this girl hold a cigarette in the mouth, and, and he would take this bull whip and cut just the tip of the cigarette off and do it two or three times till he got down right close to her mouth. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. I was just a little kid at the time when Gone with the Wind played. We weren't allowed to come into the theater because uh, some of the language, which is mild compared to today, but it was condemned. The priest condemned that movie. We had a hard time showing it here. And I remember that, but uh, because that's been of so that, long ago. Because of I don't give a damn. Because frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. It was condemned. <laughs> That's odd. Isn't it? Did people go to confession after they saw the movie? <laughs> that I don't know, but let me tell you, uh, it was ridiculous compared to the movies that's shown today. The MGM Studios, their trademark, is a line that growls at the beginning of the show. And uh, sometimes, if the record is not quite in sync, he growls before he opens his mouth. Or sometimes, uh, not too often, we'd make a mistake. And when we changed film, we put the uh, first record on. And when the character on the stage would talk, the line would roar. <laughs> and of course, there was a lot of little comical like things like this because this was really experimental at the time. I remember the smell, the candy, the crowd. Noisy boys in front, Mr. DeLoss said, not so loud. The young lovers holding hands, maybe a kiss. Hiding behind seats, the scary movies we'd miss. Gibbons well, Robichaux was so moved by the death of his home. old friend, his the Grand, he wrote a poem. When a quarter was there, Mr. Percy had candy, cough drops and licorice, so sweet and dandy. Two or three hours, maybe even more, how well we remember the grandest of lore. So farewell, dear Grand, the baby is gone too. We'll sit in the park, shed a tear or two. Remember Miss Coulon, the Levies and others? Then followed our many sisters and brothers. The grand was so grand, can I have a brick? I'll keep it close watching each current flick. The many happy hours stay with us always. We smile and think of those good old days. How much longer will the remaining old movie houses stand? The Dixie in Ruston features live music now it will stand a while longer. When we finally come to notice these landmarks are threatened, people do often come together to save them. So it is in another part of this town. People have begun to care about a special place some here still remember as a lesson in harmony. Ruston, Louisiana is a town with a unique connection to the last world war. Look closely at a few old barracks still standing on the outskirts of town. They're remnants of an unusually close encounter with the enemy. They were just as nice as they could be to me. They would meet me and they, it was good, good morning, you know. And sometimes they'd stop and try to talk to me in German. And occasionally they would come in with some flowers they had grown over in the compound and present them to me, come to the lab and hand them to me. Mary Duchaney remembers when she nursed the sick at Camp Ruston. American soldiers and alongside them, the German prisoners they guarded here for more than two years. Do you recognize the place? There are only two small buildings left. And I know there were dozens and dozens of barracks for 5,000 prisoners. Oh, yes. yes, there was. And it doesn't look the same, certainly not. I remember that these, these look like the barracks, but as far as knowing where they were or whether this was the hospital lab or whether it was an administrative building or whether it was just a ward, I have no way of knowing. And they, all the buildings then looked the same anyway. You know something? You don't remember the buildings and you don't remember the layout of the camp, but you do remember the people. Unsere beiden Schatten sahen wie ein aus, dass wir lieb uns hatten, das sah man gleich daraus. It was a world of watchtowers and barbed wire, mess halls and nightly card games, a PX where German prisoners could buy a Coca-Cola. Soldiers who once fought for world domination were rewarded with 700 fenced-in acres in North Louisiana, 
a government POW camp like 510 other ones in America. But this camp was in Ruston, and that somehow made it different. A hemisphere away, the battles roared. In North Africa, Field Marshal Ernst Rommel steamrolled over miles of sandy desert. His Africa Corps was the pride of the Nazi war machine. Rommel was even regarded by the British troops he fought as a gentleman soldier. But gentility was hardly the way of Hitler's strategist. By the time the U.S. entered the fray, German submarines were sinking our supply ships to Britain and Africa. In no time at all, the war was in full production. On the home front, we learned that the Nazis, who some in America had admired, were bloody thugs bent on domination. That fear of Germans was strengthened by wartime caricatures of leering, bloodthirsty Huns. The enemy was ruthless, craven, giant, and evil, and everyone knew it. But they were not invincible, as time and again Allied offensive hemmed up thousands of captured troops. Rommel's Africa Corps was decimated. These tank gunners and infantrymen were shipped to camps in the States. By train, the Africa Corps traveled into the heartland. Last stop for some camp, Ruston, where they were fingerprinted, cleaned up, and searched. Several times we would come by to pick up freight or something and have three or four of them on the back of a truck with a guard. And we stopped back by the house and drank coffee and never nobody ever complained about it. And none of them ever tried to escape. John Gay was assigned two German helpers at the well, camp like store. Said, they knew they couldn't get away anyhow, so they didn't want to lay out anymore. <laughs> I imagine, I imagine they had a kind of rough time in North Africa. They'd had enough. But I'll tell you this, from what I saw, they had little or no respect for their officers. We had one time had a dip there, shots they were giving the officers, giving all of them. And several of the officers, I imagine about, seemed like about 20 of them refused to have the shot. So they walked them down in front of the exchanges and the boys hung on the fence and jeered them all the way down there to the hospital. They forced them to take that shot. They do done their own cooking, they made their own bread and everything. Harold Buckland guarded the Germans on trips into town and took them on work details as an MP. I should bring in the, the grub and they made their own, boy, they made good stuff, I'm telling you. I, when I come in there, Harold, Harold, <laughs> he couldn't say Harold. Come on, come on. And I go over there, they have a big square can like that, a coffee, and a big hunk of bread and butter. Boy, I stayed there. <laughs> but you were the guard. You, they had better food than in the Army? Better than we had. For all the propaganda we had absorbed, this was a turning point in blind hatred. Many families had reason to hate, but these Huns, for a few people in Ruston, now had faces, normal, even nice-looking faces. And by all accounts, most of the enemy were not only clean and friendly, they were smart and even polite. There, there was a lot of propaganda in uh, the radio and the newsreels, and, uh, and in school, Ruston native Ruth Futrell was 14 when she saw her first German. My best friend and I were standing on the platform downtown Ruston. Her name was Sue Matthews, waiting for the train to go. And it was, it was going by real slow. And there were open box cars. And we realized that these were German POWs. And we knew about the camp. But we, of course, never been out, but we knew that it was there. And we just got real still, and, and all of a sudden, all of these boys started calling and waving and smiling. And we just waved and smiled back. It just seemed like the thing to do. And uh, the train went by very slow, and uh, I don't remember how many cars of POWs there were, but it seemed like a lot of them at the time. But uh, we had been watching all through the war the newsreels at the movies and the radio, of course, 
and our idea of Germans was the Nazis, you know, and we were the good guys. But here, all these sweet-faced young boys go by, just smiling and waving like, and it, it just kind of stunned us. And after they went by, we wondered how they were being taken care of out here. We wondered how they were treated. Fuck me, adieu. Fuck nicht und geh. Camp Rustin was known as an anti-Nazi camp, a place where ordinary soldiers were safe from hardliners and ultra-patriots of the fatherland. If there were political fights in these ranks, the Americans didn't hear of it. I could take four prisoners and go anywhere in the United States here with them and that had no trouble. What left them, it was over across, it was injured. When they come back over here, they wanted to kill the Germans. Germans were good fellows, they were all right. They had a German cook for the officer's mess down there that sent cakes on my wife all the time. They were real good. Sent cakes to your wife? Yeah. She patched clothes and stuff for them when they needed sewing, and so they sent cakes to her. They worked in the fields around North Louisiana, picking peaches and chopping lumber. When they were hired out to pick cotton, Black children were not allowed to watch. Remember, this was 1944, and that wasn't proper work for white men. So we had one that escaped, I think, on a regular basis, about once a month, and they'd pick him up in different places. In fact, I think he'd call up and tell them, I'm over at so-and-so, or, and they'd go get him, bring him back. I believe it was two who escaped and went all the way to Ringo and uh, got out there and it was cold and icy and they was about to freeze to death and they turned themselves in over there and came back to camp. They had visions, he said, of uh, going into Mexico and getting home. They wanted, all they wanted was to go home. Theater groups of POWs, yes, and they built models and baked pastries to sell in town. They made small castles in front of their barracks. They sketched their new quarters and drew a snow-covered home life to remind them of a country that by war's end they would hardly recognize. Munich's Olympic Stadium marked the entrance to this barracks. The men were even allowed to send this photo home as a Christmas card. In classrooms, they mastered government-taught democracy, free enterprise, and another language. When we are marching in the mud and cold And when my pack seems more than I can hold Even over in the compound, I never heard about any fighting or anything over there. They, they seemed to try to make the best of what they had. And except for the fact that they missed their loved ones back home, I think they were happy to be here because they weren't fighting. Their lives were not at risk and they were well taken care of. When one prisoner died, there was no German flag to drape his coffin. A woman in Ruston even sewed an enemy flag for this stranger's coffin. Certainly an extraordinary show of compassion. They kept their barracks immaculate. A lot of the, 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 of the Red Cross reports that we found in the archives records indicate that, that the inspectors were amazed that the grounds were immaculate. You could eat off the ground and things like that. And this is just indicative of that. It's, they came in and, and made a place for themselves to live. Today, the secrets of Camp Ruston can be literally uncovered. Just dig down six inches. Mark Scalia is a history student at Louisiana Tech. Some people remember this. Some people are fascinated by the culture exchange between 19-year-old German youths that were in the Africa Corps. They were in the U-boat Corps, you know, very stark reminders of the German, of the German military in Ruston, Louisiana. I mean, the social, the, the social implications are staggering when you understand that you have people that were brought up under the guise of Adolf Hitler, brought to rural north central Louisiana. And that, that's, that's very intriguing in how the two, the two areas adapted to one another. What are you looking for? What else can tell us what these guys did behind barbed wire? As we expanded that, we went further back and found what we term the patios. Uh, there are brick landings that are laid out, one in a herringbone fashion, one straight crisscross fashion. Uh -huh that coincide with the measurements of the building. And the implication, of course, is they built these things to make their barracks look nice. Uh, we found one in this barrack, 
to about 30 feet over, we found one in front of the other barrack. And it gives you a pattern. It shows you how these people lived. We hope to recreate that whole atmosphere by going all the way through this and finding perhaps more castles, a stadium, um, anything that, that says, hey, I was made by a German 47 years ago. Right at that crossroad is where the uh, double gate was, and the fences ran along this line here. Vince Spione is eager to tell the true story of Camp Rustin. He's organized as much memorabilia and as many of the old stories as he can. People with stories to tell are starting to come forward now. It's not unusual, for example, for uh, me to sit in my office and get a phone call and say there's a, uh, an XPOW up front, and uh, uh, they come back. They come back to see where they were kept. Uh, uh, I don't imagine people who uh, would have bad experiences want to bring uh, their families and take pictures mm -hmm. and, and almost come back like it's uh, a Disneyland. They come back and they have good stories. They sit down and have picnics with their families and, and, and tell us about uh, their experiences at Camp Rustin. Uh, just recently we had an Italian prisoner come back, came back by himself. And I think one of the interesting things about uh, his story is, and he told us as he left here, save those two buildings, there's nothing else left. He had gone to the other camps that he was kept. There is nothing left, and this is one of the few things in the United States that's left. If you think about, and you ask yourself this question, how many sites for World War II are on American soil? There are very few. Pearl Harbor, there are for sure some others, but here's one also, and that's what we're trying to, to uh, uh, tell the story of. That's one thing we can be proud of, in my opinion. You may not share it, but I think we can be proud of the fact that we took soldiers that had uh, fought our boys and possibly had killed some of them and treated them humanely and well. I've seen them come society in. society is judged by the depth of its humanity, the charity we showed? We did not uh, try to, to do what the Germans were doing or the powers that be to them. I understand that our boys weren't treated that well, but we treated them with kindness and consideration for the most part. There are many more stories about ordinary life and some not-so-ordinary tales of how two warring cultures got along here. If the measure of a society is the depth of its compassion, there may be an enduring lesson to be found in so small a corner of this warring world. Lost Louisiana will continue. Among the landmarks of Louisiana, there are many faded reminders of what we've lost or even forgotten. Old stores and signs can still be found along the smaller roads. These are nearly a century old. This bank was once an institution here in Garryville. But an institution doesn't have to be a hundred years old for us to lament its passing. Traditions that have made us who we are are disappearing before our eyes and nothing, it seems, can be done. For example, Louisiana State University, 1994. Alumni usually return only on weekends for football games and usually see only the flag-waving boosterism. Public concern for the old war school, which ebbs and flows with the scoreboard. But in the middle of the week, when students are busy, there is another venue for a frenetic outpouring of championism. This also is a coliseum, but of words and thought. This is Free Speech Alley. If I write a book that will endanger your life, that will endanger your dignity, your integrity, and you tell me that is free speech. You see, it is free speech. Well, genetically, you run faster than I run? No, it's impossible. Okay, but it would be okay if y'all had stronger legs and ran faster. For 30 years now, this has been the students' crucible of argument and showmanship. Every Wednesday for 30 years, this has been an informal classroom, a gathering place for kindred, if amateur, philosophers, the incubator of protest. Rodney Kennan, like hundreds of other alley regulars, remembers. I came out here from high school, skipping high school as it were, and I found Free Speech Alley. It was a knockout. There were two or three thousand people out here. They were arguing about states' rights and black and white and 
in Vietnam. I think it was Woody Jenkins and uh, 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 David Duke. They were going at it tooth and toenail. A lot of alumni remember. We'd better remember because even on beautiful fall semester afternoons, and even with so much in the world to talk about, the students no longer come. Free Speech Alley is dying. In 1964, the same beautiful fall semester afternoons. This is where the alley began, in a breezeway under the new Union building, idealistic students with minimalist aesthetic sensibilities set up a sturdy black box. It was the modern representation of the fabled soapbox from which politicians and salesmen had customarily hawked promises and snake oil. These students were different. They would hawk persuasion and sell ideas to their peers. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. A few years before, John Kennedy had ignited the nation's collective optimism, and more students enrolled in college than ever before. The children of the post-war baby boom were tipping the nation's demography towards youth, and youth is always idealistic. The Osmonds, he has football seating, are as important as eternal salvation. The other half said salvation was worthless and Nirvana was a good football seat. Like everything else that I've been through, they opened up my eyes. By the late 60s, marijuana was being smoked right out in the open at Free Speech Alley. In 1967, this is how the Chancellor was photographed for the yearbook. Odd, but telling. In 1987, the Chancellor was hung in effigy at Free Speech Alley. In the 90s, an old alley regular returned to the cradle of his public speaking career to campaign for governor. 
College changes all young people, of course. But for 30 years, this weekly event put a spin on formal education for thousands of us. Oh, yeah, she's the second generation free speech alley dog. Her mother would be probably 20 years old now. And she made the paper, I think, one, one week, 12 times. Now, a concert of pre-recorded music on the parade grounds attracts more followers than the alley. It's called a Good Wednesday When 50 Students Show. And we can fix no specific blame. We used to think the alley might be shut down by the university as the legislature had once tried. We took the forum that seriously. But then young people, to their credit, take their opinions seriously. We all learned eventually that the establishment didn't take as keen an interest as we imagined. The professors, it turned out, were often graduates of this same crucible. Yet to this day, none of the alley's founders, nor inheritance, ever imagined it would end with a whimper. No one in 30 years thought this fury would, by 1994, be ignored as an obsolete zeitgeist. It's as if um, somebody just took everybody who had any interest in, 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 in saying their view and just moved them to a different campus or something. It wouldn't matter. We could come gather together in a group of 100 even and gripe about parking and it, would, it wouldn't matter. We're not getting any response from the things that we bring up about campus issues here. I think that, that we're a lot more dependent on, on outer stimulation, you know. We, we need a lot more to, to get our attention focused on. I think they're getting numbed out by everything. Um, desensitized. Desensitized to anything, just about. I mean, it takes something really dramatic to get anybody's attention. One of my professors gave us a little survey on current events and the whole class failed it with the exception of me and two or three other people. And it, it was just pathetic. I mean, this is things people should have known. Um, I mean, simple things. They weren't complex questions. And we just, we don't know what's going on. We're sitting in our dorm rooms or apartments watching Beavis and Butthead instead of the news. And we just, we don't care. I don't think that's it even. I, don't, I really don't. Of course, the kids have gotten everything that we fought for. I mean, no draft, no wars, no, no, they sleep next to the girls so they don't have any panty raids anymore. Students created the alley from nothing but intellect and courage. Students sustain the alley through adversity and apathy. And unless students no longer like to argue, unless young people have given up on each other, we will perhaps soon again hear freedom roar. Here's an old school in Kisachi. It looks like an abandoned grammar school. It's really a monument to great craftsmanship that it has stood this long. The rich spirit of our unique culture also does remain. Maybe there are enough people who care about preserving the institutions and landmarks like this, enough of you around so that it really isn't hopeless. I'd like to introduce you to one more person who does embody the cultural sensitivity we have been discussing. He's an artist with a personal goal to preserve, at least in ink, all the vanishing places. One more reason for hope in an age of ambivalence to the Louisiana that we are losing. If there is an old church in your town, chances are it's been photographed many hundreds of times by passers-by. Tourists who drive the smaller roads of our state delight in finding landmarks and forgotten corners. They usually snap a few shots and move on. But not Andy Smith. He has a grander purpose. The photos he's taking in this small town will be added to another 18,000 shots he's taken in every town. But he's more than a collector of images. He's a refiner of images. When he gets home to his drawing table amid a clutter of odd memorabilia, he sketches the icons of lost Louisiana. Since it's my project, I get to pick whatever I decide I want to do. And so I go through the towns and just take buildings that I like, and not historical buildings, everyday buildings. So that's how Mary Lee got in there. It was one of my favorite shots, too. Because it just looked, it looks real. It's, if, if people go there, and everybody knows it, and they pass it, and they never look at it. And so when you take it, you make a black and white drawing, it's like, it's just, it refocuses your, 
you know, you look on everything. In this state, there is certainly no shortage of talented artists who capture the soon to be forgotten, but Andy Smith has published four volumes now of books in a series called Louisiana Proud. The books are part history, part documentation, and at least half clearly accurate and powerful menageries of nostalgia. How do you drive this distance over here and there's nothing, then pop, there's a town. You know, why'd this town get here? You know, how do these people live? Especially some of the towns that were big time then are, you know, are just barely shells now. And so that did pique my interest on that, to, to put that all into the book. For an amazing 12 years, Andy Smith has sat in the middle of his eclectically appointed studio, tapping out millions of detail strokes in churches and stores and street corners from Albany to Zwali. Zwali, I know. It was some Dutch person in, uh, that came over and owned land, but I don't think he really... Uh, now, some of these people are going to get mad because I'm trying to recollect, but that's, I don't think he lived here, but he owned a lot of land, and he came over, and, and uh, they named it for him. What do you look for when you are traveling and you, f you, you spot something, and do, do you actually stop the car and, and put it in reverse and say, hey, that's something I missed back there? Well, there, there are a lot of places where I didn't do enough of that because I would, I would like go to the towns and, and take, the, take the pictures of the buildings that I like, or, and a lot of times I would take maybe the whole, the whole city street and then turn around and come back and take the other whole city side of the street. But there are a lot of times when I'd pass a building up and I was going to another place and, I, and, I sh and you know, 10 miles down the road, I said, you missed it, son. Monroe's Leighton Castle was inspired by the Chateau of Europe. It inspired Andy Smith. In Bruley, that often photographed church takes on a lonesome calling in black ink. A lot of the information I got was a little green book. It was done in, the, in public works or one of these things, and it, and it took you on a tour of the whole state. The center of Mangum, a faded husk that still feels alive, but very old. The old storefronts of new roads cleaned up for your viewing pleasure. The artist leaves out the people on the sidewalk, the telephone, and power poles. The buildings stand alone, but in the imagination, they are drenched in human company. I go by these little buildings, and I look at them, and that same thing what you're saying is you wish you were a fly uh, that, that lived in that building forever, because in these buildings, all the political stuff went on, all the life and death deals, all the parades, everybody's everybody's life was right there and you got to if you were you know that building has seen all that and has seen it all through all these little towns have that that same history and that same life that in those buildings and and they're all secrets locked away <laughs> and and yeah you just need to find the key to, un, to undo the uh, thing and it would really be a good it would really be neat if you could get in on that andy smith has now done 1500 pen and ink drawings of 300 towns by now, that's enough. His fourth book in the Louisiana Proud Project is the last. Even if he stops traveling and gathering, he says he'll never shake a feeling that these old friends he's made have been and still are being betrayed by us all. Are we fast approaching a point in Louisiana where the modernization, the chain stores are all pushing, pushing these things out of the way? That would be my best guess. No, I don't. I just, I just think you're losing part of the history. You're losing part of the thing, and I understand how it becomes, a, it becomes a, a problem because those people who own the building, a lot of times, to 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 get it back in this normal thing costs a lot of money, and a lot of people in the in the towns don't go to the buildings, and it's not economically feasible for them to do it, so they just let it go down, and then finally it gets to the point where it becomes a hazard, so they just wipe it out, and I think that it's. I, I mean, I understand why they do it, but I still think it, some of these buildings need to be saved because your history is gone. It's like the old people now. The history of those small towns, it, you can't find it. And the only people who know it are the people who are still living. And as soon as they pass on, then that's gone too. There will come a day when these drawings, along with the works of other dedicated artists, will be all that's left of these places. A day when no one will be around to remember them except by opening a book. And it's good such books are being made now. 
in too many corners of Louisiana, that sad day has already dawned. Whenever you find that key that unlocks those secrets, of all those inside of those old buildings, they're not gonna be there anymore. So you're not gonna be able to open the, open the secrets up. That's my official theory. <laughs>